We are gathered together in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Messiah, God, the Son, who has come in flesh. He was crucified for our sins and bodily rose from the dead. This is the good message of the Christ. Always believe this. Never deny Him. If you're visiting with us, we've been, uh, as Josiah ground the idols of Judah into powder, we've been grinding into power a particular lie that we find out there in the world, that the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ was invented at the Council of Nicaea in A.D. 25. So that's the lie. All we have to do to counter that lie is to produce quotations from Christians prior to that time that witness Jesus being God. So today we're going to do that by the by means of the quotations, three of them. I'm going to give you three quotations this morning, all by a man named Arnobius. Arnobius writes in A.D. 305. So here's three quotations by Arnobius. Do these, he's talking about pagans, then hear with offended ears that Christ is worshipped and that he is accepted by us and regarded as a divine person. And then his second quote for this morning. Christ performed all those miracles by the inherent might of his authority, for this was the proper duty of true deity, as was consistent with his nature, as was worthy of him. In the final quotation from Arnobius, if what we say is admitted to be true, he is proved to be God by the confession of everyone. Arnobius on the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we are involved in an ongoing study of our Lord Jesus Christ by means of the book of Ezekiel. I like how this... I like how this is happening these days where we weave between Old and New Testaments uh, on the Lord's days, Ezekiel and John, Ezekiel and John, and so this is an Ezekiel Lord's Day. You've all received your handout of our translation of Ezekiel 27, and um, what a translation it is, what a translation it was. Um, I'm going to call after this week uh, Ezekiel 27, uh, both the Old Testament Revelation 18 and the Old Testament Acts 27 for two different reasons. First of all, the content that is before us this morning sounds very much like Revelation 18. Uh, you're going to see if you, I mean, just a uh, cursory scan of Revelation 18 will show you that once we get into our Ezekiel passage, yep, this is the same kind of language, same, same kind of thing going on here. So the, the New Testament Rome is the Old Testament Tyre. And then, uh, so that's as to content, as to subject matter. But as to Hopox Legomenoi, uh, this has got to be the Acts 27 of the Old Testament. What is Hopox Legomenoi? Well, that is the, I guess, academic language for words found only one time in a given corpus. So if you're talking about one, it's a hopox legomena. And I think that's one of Isaiah's favorite terms, hopox legomena. 
Now, if you're talking about a number of them, and there are a number of them in Ezekiel 27, the plural is hopox legomenoi. So I'm, I don't know how exactly how many, but I'm going to estimate there were probably 30 hopox legomenoi here that appear in Hebrew nowhere else in the Hebrew Old Testament. And then there's probably about a good 20 more that only appear maybe twice or three times. And uh, so that made for a mammoth, gargantuan week for me. When you consider that uh, sometimes these words, when you encounter them for the first time, require two or three hours of contemplation and study for each of them, um, this this week, uh, there were a number of uh, days this week where I never slept all night. I just studied down there and thought in my office. So this was a huge week. I got done at about um, with everything for this week at about 2.30 yesterday. But, um, and all of that not to yield very much by way of information uh, that you won't see maybe in your conventional translations as well. So we've got one big idea in front of us in Ezekiel 27. And so we'll go through it. We're going to, as is our custom, we'll go through this a verse at a time. And you'll get that one big idea. And then at the end of our verse-by-verse study, we won't be done with our teaching this morning, but uh, then we'll go into some application. Application that I told you that I started about a month ago. I think it was exactly a month ago. And I said, I really don't have time to get into this much today, but we'll get into it. We'll get into it today. Lord willing. So with that intro, let us begin in Ezekiel 27. You will remember that the last time that I spoke to you the last on a Lord's Day, the last um, Ezekiel Lord's Day, we dealt with the prophecy against Tyre and the prophecy of its destruction. And I explained to you how it was that the uh, that that prophesied destruction was fulfilled. I I never thought I'd remember this unless I wrote it down, and I didn't write it down. Um, I do need to correct something, a point of accuracy that I mentioned last week, or a month ago, two weeks ago, two weeks ago. Um, the Septuagint was not translated prior uh, to the reign of Alexander. That was, that was not correct. Okay, with that correction... Ezekiel 27, 1. And the word of Yahweh was to me, saying, And you, son of man, lift up a threnody over Tyre. Threnody is a word we don't uh, use very often. It means a, um, a dirge, a lament, a um, requiem. Requiem is a word we don't use much either. How about that? Let's define threnody, a word that we don't use very much, with requiem, a word that we don't use very much. All of these words speak of funeral songs, wherein you're, you're singing this song, but it's a sad song. It's about the death of someone. And so here's a threnody, a death song over Tyre. Uh, this week, we're, so we're still dealing with the Prophecy against Tyre. Next time, we will still be talking about Tyre's uh, destruction, doom, prophecy. Verse 3, And say to Tyre, the one dwelling over entrances of a sea. Remember last uh, two weeks ago when we were here, I told you about um, coastal Tyre or old Tyre and insular Tyre. Insular Tyre being that island a half a mile out into the Mediterranean that because of the fulfillment of our prophecies, 
ended up being connected by a narrow bridge of the ruins made from the ruins of old tire that that insular tire insular because it was thought to be insulated by the sea uh, that tire had two if you would entrances to the sea here there were two chief ports on that quite circular island uh, one was on the southeast and the other was I'm sorry one was on the northeast and the other was due south uh, these are seen as entrances of the sea then Tyre is called trafficker of the peoples toward abundant coastlands that is one who is journeying one who is involved in mercantile activity one who is the merchants to all of these different coastland cities in the Mediterranean so Lord Yahweh has said Tyre you have said I am perfect of beauty in the heart of the seas are your borders I think you understand that those building her have perfected your beauty Evidently, Tyre, even God admits it, was uh, architecturally, um, as far as landscape, topography, whatever, there, there's, they made the city quite beautiful. Verse 5, Cypresses from Senior have built for you. So you imported wood from Senior. They have taken all boards of cedar from Lebanon to make a spar over you spar is the um, is the on a ship it's the the long spires that go up from the ship that hold the sails so cypresses and the famous cedar from Lebanon uh, have been made to make a spar over you so if you kind of think of Tyre as a ship uh, they, we didn't just get any wood it wasn't it wasn't your proliferous oak or you know something that you can you can find very easily no it was the uh, it was the luxuriant cypress and cedar from senior and Lebanon uh, respectively verse 6 oaks from Bashan have made your paddles translating this word that means ore as paddle because there's another word more common that is used for oars so uh, we, we've got oak oars. Your plank, the daughter of Assyria, from the coastlands of Kittim, has made of ivory. I think you're starting to see this already, but this is going to go on for quite some time like this. Uh, we're talking about all of the things, all of the wares, the goods, the merchandise that come from these various places that the trading of Tyre has engaged in. So verse 7, white linen in embroidery from Egypt were your spreadings to you for you for an ensign. An ensign is a, a military flag. Blue and purple from the coastlands of Elisha were your covering. Dwellers of Sidon and Arvad were rowers for you. Your wise Tyre were among you. They were your steersmen. In verse 8, we have these dwellers of Sidon and Arvad. They, they're, they're the people that row the boat for you, the under rowers. And your wise Tyre were among you. They were your steersmen. So the ones that they viewed as wise, you understand that these people are not wise. All right? We're not talking about like objectively, factually wise. They are the ones that Tyre counts as wise. They're the, they're the people that know. They're the people that have the prudent you know, know-how of how to run a government. That's you know, it's never 
almost never is ever is it that the people that run governments are actually wise and but they think they are and so the ones that you count as wise uh, language of accommodation here they were among you and they were your steersmen they they guided they directed the affairs of Tyre verse 9 elders of Gebal and its wise were among it toughening your dilapidations uh, so dilapidations that's one of our hopox legomenoi here uh, word that doesn't occur actually it occurs twice but both of them in this chapter and so uh, you, hey if you had you had things that weren't exactly right entire they had the answer or they presented themselves as having the answer or people entire thought that they did they're going to toughen or you know, strengthen the things that have become in disrepair. All ships of the sea and their sailors were among you to import your imports. Now, with that statement, the imports specifically are going to be elucidated here. Uh, this next word here, my fault, didn't catch this. This should be Persia. So Persia in verse 10, and Lud and Put were among your forces, men of your war. All right, Tyre, you remember I told you that Tyre was a city, but it was a city-state. It had its own king. It had its own government. It was, it was not a city in the midst of what would be comprehended as a greater country, but it was its own, was its own autonomous government, uh, but as a city. It didn't have as much to draw from uh, by way of more constricting people into men into service. And so they got mercenaries from Persia, Lud, and Put. Buckler and helmet, they hung in you. So lots of them. They have your splendor. Verse 11, sons of Arvad and your forces. So the, the military forces of Tyre, but also sons of Arvad, were on your bulwarks around. That is, they're on the turrets, they're on the walls around the walled city of Tyre, keeping watch. And Gamadites were in your towers. They hung their ornamental shields on your bulwarks around. They have perfected your beauty. So here's part of what they considered so beautiful. Um, you have ornamental shields. These are shields that are associated with the military, but they're not really shields that you use uh, when you actually go to war. So it's kind of like, uh, if we might liken it to this, uh, you have uh, uniforms in just the United States. You have others as well, but I mean, you're, you're used to seeing it in the United States. You have uniforms for the military, right? But you have the uniforms for daily battle, and then you have things like dress whites, or you have the, uh, you have the, the dress uniforms uh, often of the officers. Uh, so you have uniforms for battle, and then you have uniforms for display and um, the ornaments these ornamental shields are like that they would use a shield in battle but these shields they're just for glory and so they're ornamented they are on your bulwarks around they have perfected your beauty uh, verse 12 Tarshish was your traitor from an abundance of all wealth in silver, iron, tin, and lead, they gave your merchandise. It's starting here. You're starting to see this now. Oh, you, ha you did business in these commodities, and you got these commodities from a certain place. It's going to keep doing that. All right, this, I'm telling you, one big idea. And you're just going to see them keep doing that with all the things and places where they would get them by means of their trading. 
So verse 13, Greece and Tubal and Meshech, they were your traffickers in souls of men and implements of copper. So what's souls of men? Slave trade, right? Slavery is nothing new. So slavery did not begin with the United States. Slavery has been around since, since the, the earliest books of the Bible. And those are some very early books. Those are terribly ancient writings. And uh, here he's telling us where they got their slaves from, Greece, Tubal, and Meshach. Uh, you may be thinking, I don't know if those of you who are following along in a conventional transla translation, you're seeing these other two uh, places here, these last two places mentioned in verse 13, and that looks pretty much the same as in our translation before you. But the first of those, namely Greece, you may have something like Javan. Uh, that, is the, that is the ancient name for Greece. And in the uh, book of Daniel, in chapter 8, uh, the kingdom under Alexander the so-called Great was this country. We know that as Greece today. So I've translated for that, that as Greece, that you might see the fulfillment of it there in Daniel, but now I want to be consistent. So Greece, this is the, Javan is the land of Greece. You would pronounce it Yawan in Hebrew. So Greece and Tubal and Meshach, slave trades and copper, they gave your imports. Verse 14, from the house of Togarma, or horses and horsemen and mules, they gave your merchandise. 15. Sons of Dedan were your traffickers. Abundant coastlands were the trading of your hand. Horns of ivory and ebony they caused to return to your hire. Aram, that's what we commonly call Syria. It's where Syria is today where you get Aramaic, the language from. It's the language of Aram. Was your trader from in abundance of your works in emerald, purple, and embroidery, and byssus, and coral, and gemstone. Coral and gemstone. I spent hours with the word gemstone. Just want you to appreciate that. We're just reading right by it, but... Somebody said this uh, last week, it was Easter, and uh, someone at my house said, takes so long to prepare this meal and so little time to eat it. And I said nothing, but I thought, you got that right. It's so right. And so, gemstones. They gave among your merchandise. Verse 17. Judah. And the land of Israel, they were your traffickers in wheat, minneth, and panag, and honey. All right, so is it wheat, minneth, the minneth that you get from wheat? Or is it wheat, and minneth, and panag, and honey? You say, what are minneth and panag? Uh, spent hours with each of those two words as well. No one seems to know what this is. Some make it a country, the country of Minnith, uh, which you'd kind of read it then like they were your traffickers in wheat. Who were your traffickers in wheat? Minnith and Panag. We understand what honey and oil and balm are. They gave your imports. Verse 18, Damascus was your trader. Damascus is the capital of Aram. Uh, still today the capital of Syria. Damascus was your trader in an abundance of your works from an abundance of all wealth in, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> in wine of hellbone and white wool. That is the wine that came from this place named hellbone and white wool. By the way, white looks like, a, you know, that's white. It's what, what's, what's so great about that word? Been a long time with that word. That's a hotbox legomena. It does not occur anywhere else in the New Testament. The normal word for white is not this word, and I can't think of another word to call it. So white wool 
came from Damascus. Verse 19, and Dan and Greece again, ever departing in your merchandise. That is just always traveling, ships always going. So as to supply this and to trade with Tyre, gave glossy iron, ground cassia, and cane were among imports. Dedan was your trafficker in garments of freedom for riding. What are garments for freedom? It's that it's that that don't uh, that don't constrict your movement. Like you can get on the horse like that, and you're not constricted, right? Garments of freedom. You can move around in them well. Those garments of freedom are for riding. Verse 21, Arabia and all superior officials of Kedar, they were traders of your hand in prime fatlings and rams and buck goats. Among them were your traders. Verse 22, traders of Sheba and Ramah, they were your traders in the head of all balsam, that is in the best balsams, and in every precious stone and gold. They gave your merchandise. Haran and Kalneh and Eden, traders of Sheba, Assyria, Kilmod, were your traffickers. They were your traffickers in perfect things, that is in, in high quality things, in exquisite kinds of wares, in wraps of blue, wraps, another hapax legomena, found nowhere else in the Hebrew Old Testament. Wraps of blue and embroidery and in treasures of Damask. What is Damask? You've all seen it before, though it's hard to uh, describe in words. It's a very, but if you saw an example of it, uh, sometimes in my um, American Heritage Dictionary, fifth edition, um, it's, got, it's got a picture of Damask. It's a very intricately woven, uh, intricate pattern upon cloth of a certain variety. You, you would, when, when you saw it, you'd say, oh yes, I've seen this before. That's damask. In swathed lines and cedars among your trafficked goods, ships of Tarshish, were your voyagers, voyagers, Apox Legomena, they're all over this, uh, this chapter, of your imports, and you were filled, and you were very weighty in the heart of the seas. In the heart of the seas, their geographical placement that we talked about two weeks ago. Verse 26, into abundant waters your rowers have brought you, the east wind has broken you in the heart of the seas. Now, okay, now it's saying, here's, here's, this was your situation. You were terribly wealthy, utterly op opulent, luxury in all of these goods made you incredibly rich from all of your imports, from all of your merchandise. But here's the death knell of all of it, that last statement in 26, the east wind has broken you in the heart of the seas. Why the east wind? Well, because the breaking is coming from Babylon, which is east to them. Now, verse 27, a new paragraph, your wealth and your merchandise, your imports, uh, here, they're not hapax legomenoi, but if nothing else, you'll get, you'll get used to the term hapax legomenoi uh, out of this teaching. But uh, they are not hapax legomenoi, but the word merchandise and the word imports that occurs many times in this chapter, they only occur here. So it's a number of times in this chapter, but only in this chapter. Your wealth and your merchandise, your imports, your sailors and your steersmen, those toughening your dilapidations, and those importing your imports, and all men of your war who are among you, and all your assembly which is in your midst will fall into the heart of the seas 
in the day of your fall. Again, I would reference two weeks ago when we said how that came about. Verse 28, for a sound of an outcry of your steersmen, adjacencies will quake. What's that mean? Okay, when people hear that are around you, nations around you, hear of the fall of Tyre, that those nations around them are the adjacencies, all of them will quake. Like, if this could happen to Tyre, this can certainly happen to us. Why would anyone want to destroy Tyre? Because we all get rich from Tyre. Adjacencies think... We don't supply Babylon in particular. We don't supply Babylon like Tyre supplies it. We don't have anything to give, anything to offer so that they wouldn't attack us. If they attack Tyre and Tyre goes down, we may be next. So they quake those adjacencies. Verse 29, and all those seizing a paddle sailors all the steersmen of the sea will go down from their ships to the land they will stand in other words we don't we don't sail to tire anymore we used to go to tire all the time constantly going as the one verse said now we'll just we'll go down from our ships stand on the land and with their voice they will cause to hear upon you and they will cry out bitterly and will cause dirt to go up on their heads in ashes, they will wallow. Uh, Picture somebody in one of these places. How about D-Dan? And he's gotten rich from his commerce with Tyre. Tyre's now destroyed, and these ancient symbols of grief, they'll operate in that throw dirt on your head and, you know, wallow in ashes. Uh, have, you, have you noticed that um, the, the general area that these things happen in, I hope I don't sound like uh, some kind of ethnocentric person or something, but have you noticed that the people in these areas are terribly demonstrative with their emotions? And um, these, these guys are like, they're right un- involved in, oh, Oh, we found that Tyre is destroyed? Okay, that might be surprising to you. Am I going to spread out ashes and wallow in the ashes and throw dirt on my head because of it? No, I'm gonna, it might be sad. My, my source of income has been struck. But this, you know, this dramatic display that they operate in, verse 31, and they will cause baldness to be bald upon you. That's a strange way of saying, they don't want to, how about they just make you bald? No, they'll cause baldness to be bald. That's the way it is in the Hebrew. They'll cause baldness to be bald upon you. What's, what's the deal there? That's, that's another one of those uh, ancient um, Near Eastern uh, ways of you know, saying, I'm grieving terribly. They'd shave their heads. I told some of our not our oath this morning i got my hair cut this wednesday with went with sean and uh, my uh flamingly liberal friend over there uh that's an inside joke about our barber that we go to and um i thought to myself as i'm sitting in this chair i thought this may be my last haircut ever because i'm thinking i'm gonna die no because i'm thinking this is getting so sparse, I might as well just shave it off. May cause baldness to go bald upon me. So, not, not for this reason, though. Verse 32. And they will lift a threnody up toward you in their lament. They will make a threnody over you. Who is like Tyre? Doesn't that sound like Revelation? Who is like Tyre? But it's a different beast that they're talking about in Revelation. Who is like Tyre? Like the silenced one in the midst of the sea. The one that 
has to just shut up in, in grief, in sorrow because of what has taken place upon it. Verse 33, in your merchandise exiting from the seas, you caused abundant peoples to be sated. That means to be thoroughly satisfied, to be filled in an abundance of your wealth and your imports. You caused kings of the earth to be rich. Time being broken from seas in deep places of waters, your imports and all your assembly in your midst have fallen. All dwellers of the coastlands have been desolate over you. Uh, desolate, we think that means there's nobody there. This is often a word that is used uh, to think of, of, speak of somebody being in shock or in horror in the Old Testament usage of it. And their kings have been horrified. Faces have convulsed. Traitors among the peoples have whistled over you. Now, I can't whistle. I, I can do this thing, I don't know what it is, since I was a little kid. But you know, you know how pe people, and I do this to you all the time when they're talking about figures uh, of speech, like things that people do or mannerisms that they do. I try to, try to uh, you know, illustrate that for you up here. To be, so you get the idea of the emotion that goes behind. But the whistling, you know, like people have whistled over you, like, I can't whistle, but, you know, I'm going to imitate it. Like, whoo, tire, really? There you go. Somebody help me out out there. You have been dooms. And listen to this, this last, I love the way this is worded. And there will be no you until everlasting. There's your text. Let's make some application that started a month ago. All right, well, I didn't have time, but very applicable here. And uh, very applicable to almost all of life. I want to talk about this. Um, first, I want you to consider with me possibilities as we observe national and international happenings. Okay, Tyre is a city-state. It's one of, while well, we call it a city, it's one of the nations that are out there. And God doesn't simply know ahead of time, though he knows everything ahead of time. He doesn't just simply know ahead of time what's going to happen with Tyre. He's taking credit for it. He's saying, I'm the one that makes this happen to Tyre. And this is nothing new, right? We've been seeing this all through the scriptures uh, for years now. We've been seeing this for, I mean, the whole, really, if you read the scripture, just the whole, every, you see it, you're seeing it everywhere in the scripture. But in our history, uh, particularly on Wednesday nights, we're in Isaiah now, and we've dealt with Isaiah's block of chapters that talk about the, how God's going to judge this nation and that nation and this other nation. And then we've been seeing, whenever we know, how that happened, and usually we know how that happened because it's history, and unless it's just history because it's so ancient that it has been lost, usually with the, especially with the more uh, significant as far as land mass and influence, nations that were ancient, the ancient nations, you usually have some history, people know what happened. And you know, I could say in the time before the, uh, interweb, as Sean calls it, then there you would go to the library and I could direct people. I say, you're going to go to Stapleton Stabley Library, you go to the second floor, and you go all the way to the west side, and those shelves over on the west side. That deals with ancient history. And you can see people writing that have no skin in the game, 
This is this actually what we would call a Bible evidence. No skin in the game. They're not Christians. They don't care. In many cases, are actually antagonistic against our God, against Christianity. And they're just doing the history thing. Just, they're just straight historians. And they're going to tell you what happened without reference to the Scripture, but they're going to tell you what happened and it's absolutely down to the decimal point, to the microbe, just exactly how God said it would happen. And that, those are the times where we have to say, okay, well, we're going to talk about we're going to talk about how the prophecy, the proofs, the evidences for how the prophecy predates that happening. And so often you have those, you have those very things. You have that, that prophecy fulfilled. Um, in the New Testament, that's, that's chiefly revelation. Now, I'm going, to, I'm going to discipline myself here because in the last number of years, revelation, the, the popular interpretations of revelation have become quite a pet peeve to me. And so I'm, I'm not going to launch on this. But look, if, if you take the, that mysterious book and you say, you know, let's start here. Let's start right here in deciphering all of this. Let's start here with the, the symbols that it actually tells what they mean. When the book itself tells you this is what this symbol means. And so now, okay, we got that. Now, I'm, I'm sorry, but I'm going to say no Christian has a right to say this means something other than exactly what it said it means. Okay, so no question, this is what it says it means. So can I say, can I say then, you who say that you Believe the Bible like the guy that they witnessed to. Yo, I believe everything in the Bible. Okay. You who say that, okay. You have, do you understand? You have no right to say that the beast in Revelation is the Antichrist. Because the, the book tells you who the beast is. And it tells you it's Rome. Okay. You read what would happen to Rome then. The Revelation is written before the fall of Rome. You can say, that's what God said, that's what happened. But in the Old Testament, man, you could do that. And two weeks ago, we did that with Tyre. Won't go through that all good, but Tyre is like, the, Tyre is the, one of the chief examples of, here's the prophecy, here's what happened. Look at how, look at how that happened, to, you know, down to the minutia exactly what happened. So that's like a Bible evidence. And God was throughout Isaiah, doing that block of Isaiah, and then, then we, that's where we are now. Before On Wednesday nights, before we were in Isaiah, we were in Jeremiah. Jeremiah has a bigger block of just chapter after chapter after chapter where God said, this is what I'm going to do with these nations. Do you, do you notice this too when you go through, now we're in Ezekiel's block. Do you notice that God never says, the oracle, again, uh, uh, the oracle about so-and-so, some, some nation, and then says, wonderful nation, all, would that all the nations were like this one. Therefore, I will bless this nation with, and go on in, in, in detail, like the way he went in detail about how he's going to destroy this nation. Do you notice that there's never a positive? Never one time is there a positive. Some of our flag wavers would say that God would do that with the United States. I'd beg to differ. If God were still issuing prophecy today, he would say the burden of whoever against the United States of America. And it wouldn't be like, this is the, this is the exception of all the ages. This wonderful... No, he wouldn't do that. None of the nations are like that. None of them. None of them get this. As far as their significance, you get the term from Isaiah. We haven't gotten there yet on Wednesday nights, but you get the term from Isaiah that for, uh, the, the idea of something being next to nothing, a drop in a bucket. You get that from Isaiah. Isaiah says that about the nations, plural. He says, all of the nations 
in the world to God are like, you got a little dropper and there's a bucket and you drop a little drop of water in the bucket. I said, that's, that's how God thinks of all of them, let alone some fraction of, of that drop in the bucket. The nations, all told, they're meaningless to God. Uh, he, he, so he manipulates them according to his desire, and you're seeing that here. Like, you're seeing that. I remember something where somebody got it right as to, you know, looking at what was going on in a given nation and saying, this is what God's doing. That almost never happens, by the way. Almost never does somebody get that right. Because that's a big part of what we're going to talk about today. You don't know what's going on. We don't know. But I remember one time when that was happening. Now, forgive me ahead of time, Caleb, okay? Though Meta will back me up on this. When Tom Schaller was preaching one time, and I remember him saying, it was the first time I ever heard him, heard him speak. He was in Pittsburgh. And... That's the first time I ever came to Indiana, by the way. That week, I came to Indiana. I won't get off on this, but I, I heard him, and he was saying uh, he, had, he was in Hungary. No, he wasn't in Hungary yet. He was uh, Hungary. Th this was still when the Iron Curtain was ruling so much of Europe. And he said, uh, there's, not a, uh, uh, there's no freedom. You, you can't. You can't uh, just talk about the Lord over there. You can't evangelize over there. And he said, but that's okay because that's God's way of creating hunger. Come on, I, that was good. Now, come on. It's all right. He, he's a great. I, I've been working on it. I guess I'm getting better. And he said, that's just God's way of creating a hunger for, for God. And so the Iron Curtain fell, and I remember a teaching he did later, and he said, we were sitting, we were sitting on the li in the living room on the couch, and we saw the Iron Curtains falling down on the, on, the, on the TV, and I said, let's go to Eastern Europe. And he went to Eastern Europe, and he went to Hungary, and he planned this church. And, you know, we went and visited him, some of us later. A few number of years later, we went to Hungary. And it was just as he said. Uh, this, I mean, this happens all the time in the United States, doesn't it? I'm sure this happened in Cleveland when you were there. We went to an underground mall. Went down. There's, a, there's the street level and there's a subway. Remember this? Street level, subway, and then you go down, you take this escalator to the subway, and halfway down, it opens up. They've got a mall down there. And so we go and start preaching, and within minutes, you've got 30, 40 people just standing there listening to you. Yeah, and one guy that I talked to, he, he actually came to us. You know, he came up, and he said, hey, are you, are you guys talking about God? And we said, yes. And he said, can I have one? Can I have one? He said, you come to your literature? And I said, yes. And he said, we were under the communists for so long, they never let us hear anything about God. I want to hear everything I can about God. It's what Tom Schaller was saying, what God was doing with, a, with communism. I hear today, after years of freedom, that depravity has fallen back into its old lines and there isn't that hunger there today and of course the problem with that was we were on this side of the mall and the Aryans were on the other side of the mall and that guy made a beeline right from me to them and got their literature too that was the down the downside of it but God takes the credit in every one of these cases, in Isaiah's block, in Jeremiah's block, in Ezekiel's block, add to that Amos's block, the whole book of Obadiah about one nation in particular, uh, namely Edom, the whole book of Nahum about one nation in particular, namely Assyria. He is doing things nationally and internationally 
And let's consider in broad categories what that is and sometimes what that isn't. Here's your possibilities. One, God is doing something, the purpose of which is that immediate that is evident in the occurrence. Uh, what do I mean by that? I, I mean simply, God's doing something, and what he's doing is that thing that you're seeing. So you're seeing, you're seeing this one nation take over another nation. God's doing that. Uh, so there's this, and there's that. And there's like, what is, I wonder what God's doing. God's, God's making that happen. That's pretty simple. That's the one. Possibility number two, though, is that God is doing something, the purpose of which is to use that immediate evident in the occurrence to contribute to another outcome that is his ultimate desired effect the ultimate result that he's wanting. So what I'm seeing him do, it's, it's, he's not doing that. He is, but he's doing that so that that results in something else taking place. Like if we can get this in place, that'll make that happen. So often then, when you see what he's doing, first, uh, first situation is God's doing that. And you can probably get that, you get that right because you're seeing what he's doing. But in the other one, you want to say God's doing that like it's category one. He's doing the thing that you're seeing him do. Uh, no. Yes, he's doing that. But he's doing that. That's not the, the be all and end all of why this is happening. This is happening so that this other thing happens. This is a setup for that. How do you know that this thing that you're seeing is a setup for something else? You don't. Um, someone texted me this week and, and told me about some things that were going on in our country and uh, about the effects that, that might have upon the election that takes place. Is it this year? It's this year, right? Late this year. And, um, you know, what do you think about this? And I said, I don't know. And uh, I, I said, I don't know until after it happens. And then I said, and even then, I may not know. Because, oh, does God want this to happen? I, I might see that after it happens. But how do I know that that's not really the, the point that this is for some uh, this other reason that that thing is a trigger for. I really don't know that. Third possibility then. Gets more complicated as we go along. Third possibility, God is doing something in multiple venues, all of which dovetail to produce a greater divine outcome. That is... It's like the second thing, but it's not just a, a simple, this makes that happen, but all of these things happening contribute to make a number of things happen. All of which he's got a sovereign providential purpose behind. Fourth possibility. Some of you won't like this one. Fourth possibility, God is actively doing nothing in a given sphere, but is allowing natural cause and effect to run its course in that those natural causes and effects don't or won't disrupt his other sovereign purposes. That is, not everything is... God directly, divinely making it take place. He's saying there's forces at work in this place that we could just let that happen because it doesn't affect, it doesn't adversely affect anything that I am actually trying to do if I'm speaking like God. So that's, that's just humans. That's just nothing. That's the futility of, of Ecclesiastes taking place in front of your eyes. 
and God isn't actively doing this or that particular thing. Fifth possibility. This is kind of like a collective, you understand, of all of those judgment statements all over the Scripture relative to nations. Fifth possibility, God is using natural cause and effect to promote his ultimate outcomes. In other words, the, the last one was God's, God's not doing anything. This is just how it happens. But this one is God knows how it happens. And he says, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let that happen because that's going to result in this thing that I do want to happen. So we're not going to stop that from happening. Let's just let that take its course. That'll turn out my way. Okay? Sixth, this, this one I can see causing problems with people's thinking through it as well. Sixth possibility. Now, there's a lot of words here as I tried to word this as well as I could, so you bear with me. Six, God is causing individuals. The, the chief problem word is causing. God is causing individuals to adopt viewpoints that aren't true or sensible or prudent. To become a zeitgeist. Do you know what a zeitgeist is? That's like the spirit of the age. That's the way that people, I don't mean the ultimate spirit of the age that's been here ever since the fall. I mean, I mean in a given culture, in a given place, this is the way that just about everybody thinks. He's actually causing people to think in very stupid fashion. Sometimes very evil fashion. That's, the, that's where you get the problem. But I, but I assert to you, I posit to you that he does it. That he's causing them to think a certain way so as to see a zeitgeist, that spirit of the way, that flavor, the way Americans think. You know, that's the American zeitgeist. He's, he's actually promoting that in individuals concerning which he will cease to influence once it takes root, but will not allow that zeitgeist to follow, I'm sorry, will now allow that zeitgeist to follow its natural course, cause and effect outcome, all for his divine purposes to be realized. Okay. A lot of words. What do I mean? I, I'm saying God is involved in shaping the thinking of a people, and when you look at that thinking, you say, that thinking is wrong. That thinking is not even moral. That thinking that thinking's positively evil. And that's where you can have a problem with what I'm saying, because you're saying, God wouldn't promote that evil. Really? You're all biblicists, right? That is, you, you, you believe that whatever the Bible says, that's... That's how it is. Look at a couple places with me. Let me give you an example of that one. Turn to Revelation. And uh, it has, uh, we're going to go to uh, chapter 17, the precursor of 18 that I compared Ezekiel 27 to. Revelation 17, start at verse, this, this is all kind of connected here in this context. So let's start at 12, maybe. Yeah, okay, he's, he's, this is one of those symbols where he said, no guesswork here, I'm telling you exactly what this means. Okay, so you've got this beast, right? Yeah, the one I used before the, as an example. You've got this beast. He said, and the ten horns, this beast has ten horns. It's a, it's a red dragon-like beast with ten horns and seven heads, okay? As he's just telling you what some of these things mean, and the ten horns which you saw are ten kings who not yet received a kingdom but are receiving authority as kings for one hour with the beast. These are having one council and their power and authority they are giving to the beast. These will war with the lamb. So they are anti-Christ. 
All right, these will war with the Lamb, and the Lamb will overcome them because He is Lord of lords and King of kings, and those with Him called and chosen and faithful. And He said to me, The waters which you saw, where the fornicatress is sitting, the fornicatress is defined, we didn't read this part of it here, but the fornicatress is the city of Rome itself. The fornicator, it says so. You don't have to, there's no hermeneutical acumen needed. It, it says so. The, where the fornicatress is sitting are peoples and crowds and nations and tongues. And the ten horns which you saw and the beast, we've already seen these ten horns or ten kings, these will hate the fornicatress, that is the city of Rome, and will have made her desolate and will make her naked and will eat her flesh and will burn her up in fire. Why? Verse 17. For God gave into their hearts to do his counsel and to make them one counsel. Unity is a good thing, right? Let's have unity. Here's, here's, here's some serious unity right here, and it's evil. So unity isn't always... I wonder how can... What is this thing? Uh, this is not a political thing. This is just a record. This is just like, how do you have a united nations? United. How are they united when there are nations in that organization that are at war with other nations in that, na in that organization? This just doesn't make sense. Anyway, God gave in their hearts to do his counsel and to make them one counsel and to give their kingdom to the beast until the words of God should be fulfilled. And the woman whom you saw is the great city, the one having kingship over the kings of the earth. See, that's one of those things where you say, I really don't have a right to interpret this any other way. At the time that this was written, who, who had authority over all the kings of the earth? Rome. It says that the woman is a city, the great city, the capital city of the world empire. Okay, this is Rome. The woman is the city. Of Rome. But now, here's what I want to show you. This is really stupid. You got ten kings, and, and they're going to say, we're going to give our authority to the satanic kingdom? This is dumb. Why are you doing this? Because God made me do it. Pharaoh, you're even dumber than these people. Okay. Ten plagues. Like, at, at a certain point in the plague, you want to say, man, this is stupid. Like, stop. You know, he's not that stupid. Pharaoh was not that stupid. At one point in the Exodus account, he says, I and my people have sinned. Yahweh is righteous. Me and my people and I are evil. Go, go worship. Go do whatever you want. And the next thing you read is, but God hardened Pharaoh's heart. So the guy had some reasonable logic, logical faculties, and he said, this is, I'm not fighting against this anymore. And God said, oh, no, I'm not done with you yet. You're, you're still fighting. You're still going to fight with me. Because, as God would explain it, for this reason, I raised you up. Why? Why did God raise up an idolatrous person worshiping jackal-headed, falcon-headed gods and a, a disc in the sky with rays coming out of it. This guy's, this guy, what, he's evil. What are you talking? For this reason I raised you up, that I might demonstrate my power over you and be glorified in all the earth. I'm making you the superpower of this world so that I can destroy you publicly and get glory for it. Do you see it? Let's, let's look at another one. Although this is everywhere. And see, I'm showing you places where the things that the people are doing are called evil. But it's saying that God is making them do that. Look, look with me in 2 Thessalonians. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Is it 2? Yeah. All right, we're talking about the man of sin and the apostasy, the son of destruction. 
Verse 4, the one opposing and exalting himself over everything being said to be a God or an object of worship in order that he sits in the temple of God displaying himself that he is God. Uh, jump down to what, uh, verse 6, something's holding him back. Verse 7, the secret of lawlessness is already operating, but there's that holding him back. Verse 8, and then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and nullify by the appearing of his coming. The coming of the lawless one is according to the operation of Satan, in all power and signs and wonders of lying, and in all deception of the unrighteousness among those being destroyed because they didn't receive the devotion of the truth for them to be saved. Now watch this. And for this reason, God is sending to them an operation of wandering toward their believing the lie. That is, God is saying, I'm going to make you believe a lie. And then I'm going to destroy you. I'm gonna, God's going to make them believe a lie. Now, granted, there's no Christians in this. He's not, he's not making his people sin. He's taking people who are already dead set against him. And he's saying, I'm going to give you some real foolishness. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to I'm gonna jumpstart your folly. You already hate me, and I'm already against you, but I'm going to... Make it like I've got abundant reason to be against you. And he's going to do this so that, verse 12, they all might be judged, those not having believed the truth, but having taken good pleasure in the unrighteousness. And then there's this other thing, okay? I'm going to give you the last of my seven points, and I'm still not done. And we'll pick it up two weeks from now, again, because you'll have that same situation in front of you with the uh, nation of Tyre. But here's the seventh one, and we'll, we'll close it off for today. Seventh possibility, God is answering prayers according to His will. Relative to His above-mentioned movements that He would not have otherwise affected unless his people prayed. So sometimes things are happening in the world that are according to God's desire, but that don't mistake it as the determined will of God. There are things that are not the determined will of God. In other words, there are things where he, hasn't, he has not said, I'm doing this no matter what. This is gonna, going to happen. Not his determined will but his desired will that he won't do unless you pray about it. That's James 4, 2. You do not have because you do not ask. In other words, you could have had this if you would have asked, but if you don't ask, you don't have. And this is the answer to what people have asked me all for the last 37 years of my life. If God's going to only do the things that are His will, why even pray? Well, because part of His will is to do things upon your prayer that He wouldn't do. So the premise is wrong. When you ask me the question, if God's only going to do what He wants to do anyway, and you assume that that means He's going to make whatever He wants happen happen, you're mistaken. There are things like that. We call that the determined will of God. But there are other things that he has not determined, but he has conditioned. It's his will. Like, I, I want to do this, but I'm not going to do this unless this person or these people or my people pray. When we do that on, about national and international things, like 1 Timothy 2, verses 1 and 2, that we would live tranquil and quiet lives in all piety and dignity in places where there is persecution, and we pray for countries that have governmental persecution. God does things that He would not have done if we didn't pray. 
Now, given this sevenfold set of possibilities, how can you ever know what he's ultimately doing? We are wrapping this up now, but listen. Um, I, I, want to, I, want, I watch one program daily, television. I watch one program, program daily, usually at about 11 o'clock at night with my biggest meal of the day. And it's, it's news. It's just, it's just a news program. I watch the, I watch the Fox uh, special, special report with Brett Baer, okay? Because the rest of this, what goes on, I'm not, I don't have any problem with you watching this. But the rest of the, the, of the channel, it's like, spare me. It, I, don't need you, I don't need your acting like you know what God's doing and telling me what he is. Okay, you don't know. You guys don't know. And what I want is, hey, I'm praying 1 Timothy 2, 1 and 2 all the time. I want to see what God is doing to affect those prayers in those nations. So what I want, what I want you to give me on the news is I just want you to, like, I know this is too old a reference for most of you, but for any of you who are my age or older, I just want the dragnet situation. Just the facts, ma'am. Okay, can you, can, you just, can you just give me the facts? Just tell me what happened. I don't need your commentary because you don't know what's going on. Just, just, give me, just give me what happened. And in the program, every day, there's just what happened here and just what happened there and just what happened here. And then at the end, there's the panel where we get this panel of ignoramuses together. And I don't mean like they're, they're, they're especially stupid people. I don't mean, I just mean, you don't know, what's, you don't know what, you're, what you're talking about. You don't know what's going on. How do I, why, because I know, no, I don't know either. God knows. You don't know anything. I at least know that I don't know anything. You think you know something. I don't, I don't, I don't know. And so you get the expert analysts on and the talking heads get on there and they tell you, now this is, this is going to result in this happening. And I'm thinking, you have no idea. And you, don't, and you, and you think that that's the outcome. You think that that's the end. That may not be the end. That may, that may be possibility two, three, or four. That may be, you have no idea what God is doing. The polls are showing that this guy's going to win. But you don't know the future. You don't know that three months from now, something will happen in another nation, and the nosy United States will think that they got to put, put their two cents worth in there. And one of the candidates that was leading in the polls today, because of the zeitgeist that God created prior to that event, will now turn on that man and cut his legs out from under him. And everything goes in the opposite direction. You don't know the future. You don't know the specifics, the particulars of God's mind nationally and internationally, do you? Um, I keep telling you that I'm going to quit. I'm going to tell you one other thing. It's the last thing as to as to application. God's doing that nationally. Take that down. Take that down to your life now. Your life. I can trust this God, can't I? It's like this. I'll liken it to this. I used to call chiropractic chiropractic and make fun of it until I had this five year long thing in the back of my neck and I finally said, I I'm good. I'll be open to this. And for five years, I'd, I'd walk around and talk with you and you know, I can talk to Billy here. I can talk to Billy finally. But if Perry wants to talk to me, I can only go that far. And I gotta turn like this to talk to Perry, okay? One visit, one visit, done in five years, walk out of there perfect, okay? Every time I go in there with something, walk out perfect, every time. And I go to Dr. Boma, he's a believer, and we have, we have short but significant fellowship when I go there, okay? 
But there's this thing, there's a, because I'm kind of, I, I admit I'm kind of an easy case. I'm not saying you go to him one time, everybody. I'm not, I understand I'm an easier case. But he does this thing, get down on your, lay down on a table and on your, on your stomach. Now go to one side, now go to the other side, now lay back this way. And he does some kind of wrestling move on me. And then, and then the last thing that always happens is this, what's the word? This terribly counterintuitive thing where it's like, this looks bad. And he, where he's going to take my head and he's going to twist it in a way that my, like that, that I, I, I don't not, you move my head in that direction. And it's not going to crack. It's going to crack like 10 times in a half a second, <laughs> like popcorn. <laughs> now, every time it comes to that point, this is what I do. I say in my mind, you trust this guy, relax. And he'll tell me sometimes, relax, okay. And then, and all right, what's going on? One, it's counterintuitive. Like this seems dangerous. It sounds dangerous inside my head. But I have confidence that he knows what he's doing. I have confidence that he's not out to hurt me. I have confidence that, confidence that he's competent, and so I decide to trust him. Some things that God puts us through in our lives seem counterintuitive to us, like, this isn't good. Okay, but go counter to the, in what you call intuition. This is counterintuitive, but does God know what he's doing? Yes. Is God out to hurt you? No. Is God competent? Yes. So decide to trust Him. The one having ears to be hearing, let Him be hearing. 